Good evening, good to see you this evening. We're glad you're here. I am so thrilled. I watched the portion of this morning service uh, this afternoon just to make sure the sound was good and it was much, much better. Anyone else watch it this afternoon and take a peek at it? All right, good. It's much better. The sound's excellent. So we're glad for that uh, little change and we'll see as we get things uh, going in the future how that can be corrected. Now, as far as live streaming, some of you have asked, how can I get to that if you want to get an envelope from the back there from one of the ushers and just mark on the other, write down live streaming, check other live streaming and put in your amount, you're welcome to get to that. Or we will, we haven't done also, Ms. Johnson may have already done this, I haven't checked on it, but we'll put a live streaming away on the uh, Tidely app that you can give as well there, and we'll be able to participate there and work on seeing this come to pass here uh, in the next uh, six to nine months as we go full speed ahead and trying to see some of these things done. It's more than just buying a few pieces of equipment, it's creating a whole system. And it's gotta be compatible with our sound system and to be able to go into the internet and that kind of thing. So we're working on that, getting advice. And so we, we, we need your help in it. If you'll consider doing that, we will certainly appreciate that. Also, we want to uh, continue to pray for uh, Brandon Walker. We understand there were some episodes of him being uh, terribly disoriented uh, yesterday. So Ms. Harden called and asked us to pray for him uh, as well. And we want to continue to do so as he uh, has gone through this, this uh, very, very difficult time. Uh, Marvin Mix is, uh, still needs our prayers as we wait to hear uh, about his tests and those kinds of things and Fran as they work there. And so I hope that you'll make your plans to pray for those folks, take special time and remember them in prayer. Wednesday night service will be as normal at seven o'clock. I wanna thank all of you for participating and uh, wearing the mask and so forth. We did hear, uh, and this is, this is again, being my brother's keeper. If uh, someone mentioned that if we were not gonna all wear masks, then they can't come. Again, I'm not fussing anybody, I'm not pointing anybody out. I didn't notice anybody who, when they were up and about, did not wear a mask today or cover your mouth. I appreciate that. But uh, if we understand, we don't want our liberty to be a problem for someone else. So let's be careful do it and do all of those things properly. Uh, keep your seating right and so forth. Look at the queue uh, directions, which are open, which are closed, and try to use those please. And you did a great job this morning in the last few services. And we'll look forward to, to being together again on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, until 8 o'clock. So that having been said, uh, someone mentioned to me that there is a, a curfew in Richmond. Is that true? Is that right? Someone said that? Is that right? Yeah. Curfew beginning when? For Richmond, at, for uh, for eight o'clock this evening, that does that include Virginia Beach and the other cities? Not that I've heard. Okay, just want to be sure I had not uh, heard that. Let's continue to pray. And all of this that's going on is it unusual that peaceful protests might get more sight, at least during the daytime. Why do we wait at night to do these things? They're duty three for the right. They want to destroy things and so forth. And I, I can't imagine what it would be like to have a family member in one of these places, one of these large cities where they have to flee for their life. Uh, and we want to pray for Nick, Nick Graham. Nick is a new police officer over in Portsmouth. He was on duty last night and called and asked us to pray for him particularly. I don't think this is out of keeping, but something was said to him with the effect that, you know, are you as a white cop going to kill me? And it truly tore him up. He wants us to pray for him. Would you do that? Can you imagine what that might feel like to have somebody approach you that way? So again, uh, rhetoric, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words do always hurt me. And uh, the way they've been saying it is not true. When we try to teach our kids to disregard words, but they can be hurtful. So let's pray for men to go through this time. And other, pray for Bill Gilbert and others who are going through this time. Jed Jewell related folks here and folks who are uh, with our uh, police protection, our police force. Let's pray for them. All right, Brother Art, please come lead us in our first song.
Let's stand, please. Glory to his name, down at the cross where my Savior died. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where from cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin, Jesus so sweetly abides within, there at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name, glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name. Remain standing for prayer, please. Pray together. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the glory that we can give your name. We're thankful for your watch care over us. We're thankful, Lord, for our people, as far as we know. None of them have contracted this virus and had to uh, suffer through it. We pray you'd be with each one who is going through it. They have contacted it. We pray that numbers will continue to decrease, that our practice of this distancing will help both our, uh, our state, our city, our nation, and get us back to normal, would you please uh, have people use good judgment in all that we're doing with this, respectful of others. And dear Lord, for our country tonight, it's getting ready to fall dark again, city after city as it goes across the country. I pray, dear Father, that your restraining hand will hold back this destruction that's going on. Dear Lord, would you please stop the... Uh, the uh, meanness and the crime that's going on in an effort to explain uh, the people raging and imagining a vain thing. Father, would you and your sovereign hand do your work in our lives, we pray. Help us tonight as we go through a very sensitive subject to understand that you dealt with it. Help us to be like you. And I pray that you'll bless now uh, this time. We give it to thee in Jesus' name. Amen. May be seated. Now let's see a recorded number for us. We appreciate again Mac and Beth Lynch and the Catawba Springs Christian Church uh, doing these videos and making them for us. They're very well done. Watch the words, listen to them. This 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 number will speak to your heart. <laughs> He was just a little boy, he had just a little food, he was just another nameless face among a multitude. Just a youth. How could anyone have guessed how he
Take your Bibles now. The way Jesus addressed racism. Turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4 is an excellent passage where the Lord takes an opportunity to go against the grain of social norm. He takes the opportunity to go address the outcast in a Jewish society. Please let me give you the setting for this. If you remember Jonah himself, was somewhat indignant because God had forgiven Nineveh, who Jonah knew was an enemy of, of the Israelites. And that God, who's plenty of some mercy and all of that, he knew God would forgive them. But he was angry at a nation, angry at an enemy, and uh, was, was angry that God had done all of that for him, or, or done all that for them. You find other instances as we come down through the history of, of, of Israel. And of course you have the divided kingdom in 930 BC. Then you have the northern ten tribes who never obeyed God and set up their worship system in Shechem and Dan, And they uh, defied God and didn't want people to go worship in Jerusalem. That in 722 BC the Assyrians came on the northern ten tribes and attempted to do the same to Judah and Benjamin but were unsuccessful by God's protection and they were taken into captivity. The practice of ancient kingdoms was to take people out of their relative homeland that they knew well 
could defend well, could hide well, and deport them to another region of the world that they had also conquered. Then they would take and deport from other regions of the world into a place like Israel and have them settle there. The same thing was being practiced by the Babylonians. And you find that in the mixture of these cultures and these nations, you find an intermarriage taking place. And the intermarriage produced an offspring that, the, that through rabbinical tradition and through all sorts of prejudices, the New Testament world that Jesus came into had such a feeling between Jews against Gentiles Many times in the scripture, the Jews referred to Gentiles as the heathen. And the scripture does the same. You also find there was a very, very, very hard, that to some degree still exists today, within the Middle East, within Israel itself, between Jews and the folks they called uh, Samaritans. There's a lot of uh, different discussion as to where the Samaritans came from. Some believe they were descendants that intermarried with these countries being brought in and de deported to Israel. Among those that were left behind for uh, Ephraim, Manasseh, the half-tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh, half-tribes on the west side of Jordan, and the Benjamites. At this point today, searching out lineages at the last report, there were 820 people that had lineage going all the way back to those times in the five and four, three, four and five, six hundred BC uh, to Israel. 820 of them still exist. There's a group of them that live south of Tel Aviv. There's a group of them that live near Shechem, present day West Bank. And you find that these people were, were hated by the Jews because they were invaders into their land and the intermarriage was rejected. Remember when Ezra and Nehemiah came back, they dealt with some of that intermarriage if you read your books there and how they had done that against what God's truth. They had taken on multiple wives and taken these people and uh, into their uh, homes. And so not, not as a kindness, but as a, diso uh, as, as a disobedience to God. So Jesus comes into the city where the greatest of all Indians, as they were called, are Samaritan lineage people, was Herod the Great. Herod the Great was of the, uh, an Edomite background, intermarried with the Samaritans, and he claimed to be the king of Israel, king of, king of Judah, and they hated him. He was a master builder and a, and a tremendous architect in all the things that he built, Sesame of the Sea, Masada, uh, the Herod's temple that Jesus entered into and ministered there. And yet you find that he was hated. The Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, Sadducees, the Herodians, all of them, Herodians were given that name because they participated with the government and so forth. They weren't they weren't fans of Herod, but they were participants of the government within secular society. All of these people were very uh, 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 fractured. The Sadducees, the liberals of the day, did not believe in the resurrection of miracles, and the Pharisees, if you will, the more liberal people of the day, the one to practice everything, they kept the Talmud uh, 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 at their uh, very reach to try to interpret all of the rabbinical traditions that have been delivered through that writing called the Talmud. And so Jesus comes in to a fractured, sectarian, and some degree racist society. And he's going to offer himself as the Savior for all men. Isn't that interesting? That he comes to the middle of all of this fractured society and offers himself as the Savior of all men. Now let's be sure we understand, and I, I, I was raised in a home that although there was rhetoric offered before my dad was saved concerning black people in our home, my dad was kindly affection toward uh, our Afro-American fellow citizens all of my days. When I was a little, little child, my mother worked at the giant open air in Portsmouth, Virginia, when my dad worked for the Beltline Railroad. There was a dear uh, Afro-American lady who watched me and she took care of me. And, uh, and I loved her. I remember as a little lad uh, liking, liking to have her. I remember going with my dad 
and walking over in Berkeley Yard together, I'd go with him to work and walk up to the train yards. Before scanning was done, he would write down the cars that checked out uh, headed towards Sewers Point or the Ford plant or whatever those different things that are part of our, our culture and our setting here in Norfolk and uh, Virginia Beach. And there were people when it was raining, uh, folks in the Afro-American neighborhoods that would invite my dad in to have coffee while he was waiting for a train that was running late. They would come out and bring him snacks and cookies. And they would say, when are you going to bring that little boy with you again? He's so much better to look at than you. And they, they, would just, they had a wonderful time together. One of my dad's best friends at, at his work in, over in Portsmouth, where he worked in the Port, uh, Portsmouth uh, yard office there, was uh, James Earl's father. And uh, Mr. Earl's was very kind to me. Always we got along that way. When I went to school, remember I went to school, I was born in 1956, I went to school in the middle of the civil rights age, in the 1960s. I, as a child, was amazed to see President Kennedy on video and on TV shot, to see uh, Ruby shot, uh, uh, Ruby to shoot Oswald. I saw uh, Wallace shot. I saw and witnessed all those kinds of things in my life and I wondered what was going to happen. As a child, I was a young person, we weren't involved in it, but Will will probably recall this, there was a riot at Mid-City over in Portsmouth years ago. Stores, stores were torn out and it became known in my locale that there's certain parts of town you didn't go to because you would be beat up. People from Collinswood did not cross the track and go over to Cavalier Manor because when you did, there could be a problem. Well, in the middle of the busing thing of busing and all of that, I got bus to bus to Cavalier Manor Junior High School, and that's where I remember uh, somebody called in with a bomb threat years ago. And three different days, shut the school down, and we would go outside and stand for hours while they had to go through the building. And my dad said, the next time that happens, you just come on home. But he forgot to understand. I went home. I had to walk through Cavalier Manor to get home. I didn't walk, I ran, because I didn't want something to happen. I can remember people trying to make a black and white thing in school between people. And some of my best friends were, were Afro-American black uh, individuals. And we played sports together, and we got along fine. I will say to you that racism is fueled and ignited by a few people who stir the pot when sometimes we can work it out ourselves. And I remember going through those times, and but I always had the issue that I always thought in the back of my mind, and this is totally up to your preference and up to your viewpoint, it is a social issue. And the biggest thing that always was told to me as a child was that you could not marry out of your race. That was the, that, that was the big thing. If you did that, you were an outcast, the black community would throw you away, the white community would throw you away because you have intermarried within those races. And that was the big thing that if you remember, those of you who've been around, that was the big thing that whether it was uh, Governor Maddox or whoever it was, George Wallace, a lot of that was over the intermarriage issue, okay? And there are those today who would have their preference. I don't blame you if you have a certain preference, you know? I would, I would feel funny for my daughters to marry a foreigner from a different culture. I'm not saying they're wrong, but I want to be sure that those culture could, culture could work out, lest there would be a strained marriage. I know particular, we have of course Noel and Mary sitting here tonight, but I know particularly some people who married Europeans, I won't say which country, it wasn't England, but married Europeans from the mainland and testified to my wife, it, I love him with all my heart, but it has been a hard thing for our cultures to mess. Because how I was raised and how he was raised are two different things. I watched many of those kind of marriages end in divorce when one of our deacon's daughters in Dayton had married a man from India. I'm not indicting Indians, I'm not saying they're all bad, but the culture was different for her. And when she went through all of that and, there, and, the, and the marriage did not last, God superintendent has taken care of her all of these years. Why do I say all of that? 
Because Jesus came into a fractured society and there's been fractured societies ever since. Because at the root of all this is that we don't understand exactly how God views it. And before we go to John 4, I want you to turn to a very famous passage. Keep your finger on John 4, but Acts 17. In Acts 17, we have a very famous statement by the Apostle Paul on Mars Hill. He is dealing with a society that is bent on discussing everything. Here these people have built a, a god, a, a, a statue of this god and that god. They, they were so important or so uh, able to talk about all these things, they built one to the unknown god. And Paul took that and used that to introduce to them the unknown god was going to be Jehovah God as he had a time to speak to them. And we know that they eventually rejected. But please notice the words in verse 22 of Acts 17. The Bible says, Paul stood in the midst of them, the Bible says, on Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and behold your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you. You don't have any truth about him, I'm going to give you truth about him. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth, giveth to all life and breath and all things. And hath made notice of one blood, how many nations? All. all nations. We are all the same blood descendants from Adam and Eve. Amen. We are all one nation. A one blood of, uh, for all nations, of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and have determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation. God has had the mountains be formed in the bounds and so forth. They that should seek the Lord, it, that for the purpose of verse twenty-seven, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after Him and find Him. Though he, though he be not far away from every one of us. He pictures those searching for God as blind men trying to find their way. For in him, notice, we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we also, we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art of men's device. In the times of his ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world of righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. He's saying the time's going to come when all people are going to stand before, by God's design, that man the appointed one, Jesus, to be judged. Now, as I grew up and we had this interracial marriage thing and dating thing going on and it raged everywhere to the Supreme Court and so forth that it happened, then people began to realize some things. I had the most wonderful opportunity in my life to help me. Here's how I discovered that we are all one blood and one nation, or one blood uh, from all, for all nations. We all know and love Gerald Beverly Bryant. Amen. Gerald Bryant came to our church. I'll never forget it. Abby's here tonight so she can verify the story. He came to our, ser our service. Gerald, I think, is about six foot five, six foot six, and he's always uh, shaved his head that way. And our assistant pastor told Abby, she was, I don't know, seven, 10 or 12, at that time, 10 or 11, said, uh, Michael Jordan's in the service. <laughs> Michael Jordan is in the service at, 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 at Grace Baptist Church. And uh, what was unique about it was uh, he came by himself and he came for a few services and the people welcomed him. He was kind of low key and was, was reserved. And then he said, Pastor Baker, can I come by and speak with you? And, and, and talk with you because I'm enjoying the church. They live just about a half a mile away and we have been doing a large construction project putting roofs on the flat roof building up there uh, in, 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 uh, in Dayton. And he said, can I come in and talk to you? I said, certainly, Gerald. 
He, and he came in and said, Pastor, well, I love the preaching. I love what's going on. I, I, I enjoy your messages, and I want to bring my family. I said, wonderful, bring your family. He says, there's one thing about it, and I remember him looking at me with that long finger and saying, I, I married a white woman. Is that going to be okay with you? I'll never forget how that hit me. It wasn't that, it, it didn't take me long. I said, certainly you can have him come have her come and your children and so the next Sunday they brought to our church this was in now understand this is in probably 1998 96 97 98 somewhere in there I don't, I don't have the, the date pinpointed but I can recall that I had at least two men come to me and say to me and put pressure on me pastor are we gonna let that happen in our church and I remember saying to them, absolutely. Amen. Because there's a person who came with care. And then I began to relay some of the conversations that Gerald and I had. Here was always my, my find when I tried to talk to somebody about this issue. It was always a defense and a defensiveness that they called me a racist because I just wanted to ask the hard question. How about this? How about children? How will they be received? Gerald Bryant sat down with me and said these kinds of words to me. Pastor, I want to come to tech. I want to come. I've been here so long, I'm goofed up. I, 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 I'm coming to Grace Baptist Church, and I want to be so faithful to God and honoring God that you stop seeing color. That's right. You start seeing me. And he began to do that, and he began to put some feet behind his words. And I had two more men come to me, two, the two same men, you mean, and I gave him some leadership in the church. I didn't at that time because they were new, they were doing <laughs> stuff, but uh, I made him the chief of the snow brigade. That's a real high position, right? When it snowed, we, we, we bought an air and snow blower to blow off the sidewalks and it was a big auger type thing and blow that snow 30 feet away and try to clear off. There was a hill there in our church. If you've ever been to Grace and, uh, and Dayton, and if it gets slick, you can't get up the hill. So a lot of our folks, I'm not going to go up there and slide up and down that, or have a hard time getting up the hill. So we'd, we would treat the hill, we would plow, we would do all that, we'd get out there and do it by hand sometimes to make sure people could get in uh, to God's house. And Gerald says, I want to take it, let me have it, give it to me. And he began to perform that way and cut grass and do things and be involved. He said, I want people not to see me for color, but see me for who I am. And I think those men came to me and said, Pastor, now you're going to give him a position. <laughs> now you're going to give him leadership. What's next? You're going to make him your uh, next deacon or assistant pastor? I said, if God wills it, yes, get over yourself. And I remember saying that to them, and I was a little shocked because I was always, but Gerald helped me understand. We are all of one blood. Gerald was not on a, 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 uh, a crusade to get everybody to be like him. He said that's personal choice, that's everybody's preference, and if somebody doesn't want somebody to marry outside their race, God bless them. If they do, God bless them. It didn't, that wasn't it. His idea was we're all of one blood and we are serving God together. Let me be a Christian brother and you'll forget what color I am. So much so have I had that endearing relationship with him that even though God had different plans, I was talking to him about possibly working on staff with us. And I would have been thrilled because he has the right balance. Now there are others who are on a crusade and say, if you don't agree with me, if you don't allow your children to do that, then you're wrong and you're racist. That is narrow-minded and that's just as bigoted the other way. People can have their own opinions about that and operate fine within God's realm because we need to all serve the Lord that we don't see color. Amen? We see each other. That's what helped me. But this passage helped me. In Acts 17 and in John chapter 4, Jesus thrust into the sectarian, divided, bigoted, the Jews hating the Romans, and the Romans looking at the Jews as dogs. This is what Jesus came into to offer himself as a savior. I want you to notice, first of all, we kind of have a definition of the problem. 
in verses 1 through 8. Look with me, please. And when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And this very famous statement, he must needs go through Samaria. Now please understand the sectarian nature of the day. If you remember our study of Bible geography, you have the Sea of Galilee in the north, the Jordan River that runs north to south and runs into the Dead Sea, and that really divides between the Eastern Plateau and then the Jordan Araba, the Jordan Valley, and then the Central Mountain Plain over to the Mediterranean Sea, and you have uh, that area. Most people, most Jews, when they left Galilee, they so despised the Samaritans and they hated them, they would not go through Shechem in the Central Mountain route they would go down south or east of Galilee, come down the eastern side of the Jordan River, cross near Jericho, and then go up to Jerusalem for the feast days. So they didn't even want to go through Samaria. But then this passage, John, the gospel presenting Jesus Christ as the Savior of all the world, said he must needs go through Samaria. There has to be, if you will, that time, that uh, definition of the problem. There has to be an ability to approach this and talk about this. If you think about it, that's what helped me most in my own experience is that I had somebody to talk to that was not of a defensive, calling me a racist, inflaming more problems and division to let me speak to this and let me get my questions answered. And it's an amazing thing that when you think of the ministry of Gerald Beverly Bryant, they went back to Kentucky. They went back to an area that was known for this kind of thing going on, that blacks hating whites and whites hating blacks. And Gerald went back with that same thing in mind to underprivileged and impoverished people in his county in Kentucky. And I'm saying to you, it's time for God's people to be able to talk about this. Amen. My dad talked to me about KKK meetings. I understand that. He was never a member. He knew some people that worked for his railroad that were. And there was a time, for those of us who've been around here a long time, uh, knew that there was an active chapter of that that operated in different ways in this area. Am I not right, Brother Kirk? Am I right, Brother Will? When we were kids, I remember that. Burning crosses in people's front yards, doing that kind of thing for intimidation. Thank God we can come to a point where we ought to be able to talk about these things. Jesus did. He thrust himself into the area that the norm was, you don't go there because they are hated people. I want you to notice secondly, in this, in this definition of, of the problem, he cometh to the city of Samaria, verse five, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, Jesus therefore being weary with his journey, set thus on the wall, it was about the sixth hour, that would have been noon. Six hour of the Jewish day. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink. For his disciples were gone and away uh, unto the city to buy me. It was of necessity that Jesus went through Samaria to have this meeting with this Samaritan woman. And it, it is of necessity that we need as God's people if you have this racism or you have bitter feelings toward people of another race, that we get over it. Jesus confronted it by addressing the issue. He speaks to this woman. There were some people that I know that I grew up with that if you spoke to a black person, they thought you were evil. They thought you were wrong. At the same time, there are those that cram racism down your throat so much as the trump card for everything that happens in life that it becomes infuriating. We have it on both sides. And really some of the most racial, racially prejudiced people that I have known in my time were black people on their own people. James Earls is one of them. Because he went to preach at white churches and had white fellowship with men, they throw him, called him Uncle Tom's. 
carrying the water for all the white, white preachers and all that business. You say, that's awful. It's awful because we can't see beyond color. Listen, how hypocritical are we if we send missionaries to the regions beyond, to the black people of Africa, and have a race, racist heart? How can we do that? And you say, preacher, well, you're going to have all of our... Listen, it's your choice and your instruction and your guidance to have your children marry who they want to marry. Please don't, please don't get upset with me about that. But I'm not going to reject or condemn anybody who chooses to marry outside of their race and call them a... reject them or whatever, or say that is the norm. It is what it is. We are all of one blood for all nations. So the dialogue needs to happen. Jesus defined the problem by coming and speaking to this woman. Now notice the discussion of these norms, the norms of prejudice and bigotry and all that. Notice what, and, and, they, and they have a discussion. Then saith the woman, verse nine of Samaria unto him, how is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? She is asking that question because of the prejudices and the and the division of the day. You think we're half-breed, intermingled people that came in here and you hate us. You don't have anything to do with us. Isn't it amazing that one of the sweetest stories ever written, one of the most beautiful literary pieces ever written on this, the whole history of man is the story of the Good Samaritan. The one who the religious people walked by this person who was who had fallen among thieves and didn't want anything to do with them. And then the Good Samaritan came and how Jesus used that as a wonderful picture and can be a parallel to what, to what the Holy Spirit does in our lives and takes us to the end. Picture perhaps the church of God pours oil in the wound. This is an outcast who did the job in this man's life. And it's truly a blessing to understand that Jesus became to this woman, a good, not, not, not a good Samaritan, but a good Jew ministering to a Samaritan. She says, why are you talking to me? Because there are these, uh, the recognition of the alienation between them. Why, why are you talking to me? Jesus says to her in answer to her question, for the Jews have no dealings with, with uh, the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would give thee living water. Jesus de de deflects that, that social norm by saying, If you would understand the redemption that eventually she'll find is in him, you would ask of that water, and he'd give it to you freely, and it would be living water. She responds. There's a conversation going on. Social arms are being broken. Truth is being shared. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou, hast, hast thou that living water? She begins to reason with him uh, concerning physical things. Well, if you have this water to give, and you want to give it to me, these physical limitations... How can you get the water? The well is deep. How are you going to do that? So she immediately speaks with the natural mind, an unsafe person's mind. How can you give me living water when you can't even, you don't have anything to dip with, anything to draw with, and the well is so deep? Jesus begins, continues to dialogue with her. Verse 13, Jesus answered and said unto her, he, well, she says, Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well? and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle. you got to understand, there was a religious division too because the Samaritans believed that Mount Gerizim was the place that they should worship, not Jerusalem. That Jacob was the actual patriarchal father for the whole nation and not Abraham. And so uh, there was a division religiously as well. They had their uh, different ways to worship and so forth. And so she's, she's, she's bringing up her father and her lineage and all of that that's here. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst again or thirst. For the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. I am the answer. And it's still the answer today. 
America, big cities, all across this nation today, the answer is not burning things down. It's dialoguing and listening to what Jesus had to say. He can give a well of water that springs up into everlasting life that we don't have to drink again. When asked to me, she says, it's a giving program. She says in verse 15, the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water. The two things that I thirst not and that neither come here to draw. You notice she came at the noonday hour. That's the hottest time to draw water. Normally she would come, the, the people would come in the morning and the evenings to draw water for the days of cooking and the nights bathing and so forth. Here she is an outcast probably from society. She's coming by herself. Give me something, Jesus, that'll keep me from coming here in the hot noonday sun and drawing any more water and carrying it back. Jesus Continues, the woman saith unto him, or Jesus says unto her, Go and call thy husband and come hither. This is where that, the omniscience of our Lord is so wonderful. He knew she did not have a husband. The person she was living with was not her husband. The woman answered and said unto him, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands. And he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, in that said us in that said us thou truly. He not only used his omniscience, but he used it as a way to break down her defenses and get her to think spiritually. She says, the, the woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. She brings up the problem. You think that worship is in Jerusalem, we think it's here. So again, she's throwing out the salvo, she's throwing out the bullets and saying, this is the problem. Your lineage, your worship, our social problems, our norms that we have accepted, we don't like each other. Jesus keeps cutting each one of them down. Notice what he does. He says unto her woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews, but the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Not only was there the discussion of the norms, but, but there was the, the uh, declaration of the absolutes. Jesus says, one day it's not going to be Jerusalem worship, it's not going to be Gerizim worship, it's going to be worshiping in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit, and he will meet with us there. Aren't you glad we don't have to go to Jerusalem to offer our sacrifice? Aren't you glad Washington is not our Mecca and we have to go there to do something? Amen. We worship God in spirit and in truth, and part of it was used to break down this woman's wall. Let me say to you, you know, you know the way to break down the wall for unsafe people's lives is to have some dialogue with them. Begin to speak to them. You might not agree with everything they do, they do or say, but you begin to understand and find out what makes them tick. What are their hangups? What are the things that they, how do they view church? You know, the tragic thing that I hate, Brother Nick's situation that is, just burden his heart today and he asked us to pray for them, for him and for his wife. Is that one bad policeman that made a terrible judgment and made a, and did an awful thing from what we know. Suppose he indicts every policeman. Especially if they're white. The same thing happens when one preacher does wrong. It's like every preacher wants your wife or your money. That's what they want to say about all that. Mm -hmm. But what is unfortunate is that the same general, generalizing that they do on the outside looking into the church is the same kind of generalizing that we do from inside the church looking out. Mm -hmm. Well, look what that guy looks like. He, why would I want to associate with him? Look what that person's doing. Why should I want to associate with him? We think about that, we can be just as spiritually prejudiced as we are racially prejudiced. If we're not careful, how do you talk, how do you deal with it? You get beyond 
those initial things and find out that a lot of times all this stuff that you see people do and wear is just a facade. They're scared to death. They don't know what to do. They need somebody to capture their confidence and listen to them and be able to dialogue and talk with them to give them hope in Jesus Christ. What did Jesus do in this racially divided sectarian society? He dialogued with this person and he gave himself. Now you and I don't have much to give. We're not Jesus Christ, right? But we do have him in our heart Amen. to try to share and give with others. I remember early on in my in my ministry when I got trapped in a situation. I went to visit a young couple that had been attending the church. Marcia and I sat in the living room. She'll remember this event. And they asked me, you know, you went to Bible College University, what do you think about interracial marriage? And at that time, I was saying, well, I, I, I think it may not be best, you know, socially you could be rejected, you might not have as full of ministry if people rejected your ministry and all of that. I was trying to be practical. I had no real scripture to say that I think that would be wrong, and I still don't today. But have that have a scripture to condemn that. There may be some practical reasons or whatever, but, but that's everybody's preference. But here's what I'm saying. They said, well, well, would you marry somebody or so forth? And I would say, at this time, I won't. Would you do this? Would you do that? And they let me off. And these people both were as white as they could be. And I began to think, well, they must have a relative that's getting ready to try to do this, and they want some advice, so I want to pontificate for them and tell them how I think and how I can help and all that kind of thing. Well, then they, they, they began to explain to me, well, we've been married, and our parents hate us because my husband is Puerto Rican. Now, naive as I was, I thought Puerto Rican West Indies people would be dark, black. This guy was of European stock or whatever. I know there's some of that going on there. And I said, well, that's not a problem. You're white. She's white, whatever. What's the problem? He says, you're a racist. That's the problem. Remember that, Mark? I mean, biggest day. And you can leave my home right now because I'll never come back to your church. You are a bigot. I left and said, wow, I got trapped. I got led down a path that was point of no return. And yet God used that to melt my heart to get ready for a Gerald and Beverly Bryant. And get ready to stand in love, even against some of our most seasoned men that had a problem with it, to say to them, you know, you need to get over it. It's time. I had to rebuke a deacon because he kept in talk in the lobby and over coffee talk, talk kept using that N word. And I said to him, you got to stop. That's hurting your testimony. I don't care what you might feel about that. You have to deal with the Lord about that, but you got to stop. He says, who are you to tell me? I'm telling you because I care for this flock and you're ruining your testimony because of your mouth. And he said, okay, preacher. And you know, we're still friends today. And he got over it. And he said, you know, I don't see Gerald Bryan as a black man anymore. I see him as a brother. Amen. So time enough, if you want to solve racism, we don't go burn down buildings. You give them Jesus. You dialogue with them. You do not allow yourself to be socially, racially, uh, in any way. Now, it's aggravating for all of us. I don't care what color you are. For activists, and the president had the right word, thugs that come into a community and get everybody riled up over an incident that was horrible and wreak havoc and fear where people are afraid to go to the grocery store. That's not America. And so we need to be sure that those kind of people, and they are right on the television airways what they're saying today that these people are domestic terrorists. That's what they are. Yes. And, they, and they need to be taken care of and handled properly, prosecuted. 
And I hope that you understand we need to have the Lord Jesus. He must needs go through Samaria. You and I must needs go down this path if you struggle with it. We must needs dialogue with this kind of thing. Pray that God will put your path across someone that will make you understand. That whatever's going on in this country, if, if, if black young men are being pointed out and they are being discriminated against, they need to be respectful and talk to be respectful and obey what's being asked of them. But no one deserves to be killed like that man was killed. Amen. I don't care what color you are. If that were my son or my father, I'd be livid. But I would not want the death of my son to be a clarion call to demolish a city. That's a discredit to Mr. Floyd. It's not a credit to him. All that having been said, may God give us a heart that understands that you and I are hypocrites if we give the missions to see black people want all over the world and we have a problem with them. Or Japanese or Orientals or anybody, even Arabs, Amen. who are our enemy at this time. If they, but we need to ask God for grace. And sometimes when you talk about these kind of sticky subjects, people get their feathers up and if you need to come see me, come on and see me. I'm not, I'm not being ugly about it. I'm not being, uh, I'm not, I'm not being um, arrogant about it. It was a hard thing for me to deal through with that. I'll tell you one more story and I've got to do it quickly. There was a couple in our church who were dating each other. One was an Oriental, one was a, a white girl. Her parents called me and said, I want you to tell my girl uh, not to date this Oriental because we don't think it's right to marry outside your race. And I said, okay, and, and I talked with her about that and she broke off and of course the young man was attending our church and he was an adopted Okinawan. And I, I said, I don't think that's the best to do. And they said, wow, you're a racist, you're prejudiced. Sat down, told, told me all kinds of things, hateful things, and they were hurt as parents, and I understand that. And I said to them, I'm just being consistent. If I, if, if I won't marry blacks and whites, and not Orientals and whites, then I'm being, I, I, I am being racist. I only am dealing with one, but I'm trying to be consistent. And so they got mad with me and they stayed in the church. They stayed there the whole 21 years. We got over that together because I realized in the middle of all that, that I can't say, you can't say it's totally right. You can't say it's totally wrong. So it's going to have to be a thing of preference. But please excuse me because I would not want to participate in that kind of marriage. And I changed that position later. But I'll tell you this. Those people, even though we disagreed, they have the sweetness of the Lord about them and they accepted me and we loved each other and we served together for 21 years. And one of the, that dear brother who was the head of that, of that group of folks in our church, the father just died here recently. But why did all that happen? Because we wanted to be sure Jesus was sin. Let's dialogue. I don't have time tonight, but there was a lot of discipling that happened. She brought all the people they came. The fields were wide in the harvest, and the fields were four months wide in the harvest. So it wasn't the seed pods of the white harvest that they when Jesus was saying, Look, lift up your eyes and see the fields are wide in the harvest. It was the people coming out of Shechem to come out to the well. Amen. And when they saw the people, Jesus says, Look at the at the at these Samaritans, these outcasts, these people that we're supposed to hate. Here they come. The fields were wide in the harvest. And God used that to disciple them. And many believers came out of that meeting at the woman at the well. Because Jesus broke through the social norms. And said, this must be done. May God help us to do it. And all God's people said, Amen. let's stand together and be dismissed in prayer. We'll disperse singing tonight, Art, because I've gone to the very hour. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, would you dismiss us with your blessing? Help us to understand that there are some social prejudices that still exist in our own lives. It might not be just black and white. It could be others. It could be Oriental, Japanese. It could be Arabs. It could be lots of those. Dear Lord, we are all of one blood for all nations. Teach us to trust you and this dialogue to share the truth of Jesus Christ. What 
Virginia Beach, Richmond, New York, Chicago, Seattle, Atlanta, all of these places that are, Minneapolis have gone through destruction. They need the gospel preachers and believers to try to dialogue with the truth of the blessing of the gospel. Lord, would you change us? Into your image we pray. Dismiss us now with your blessing, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.